to our live. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody in Brazil. I think good morning, the US, good evening in Vienna or, or Leipzig, I would say. Um, we are going to have the second talk of the day. The title is Cavell on putting the, the human animal back into language and therewith back into philosophy. The speaker is Professor, Professor Arata Hamawaki. Arata Hamawaki is associate professor in the philosophy department at Auburn University. He works primarily on topics connected with Kant, Wittgenstein, epistemology, philosophical psychology, and aesthetics. The respondent will be prof Professor Richard, uh, Richard Eldridge. He's a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He's the author more recently of Werner Herzog, filmmaker and philosopher, and Images of History, Kant, Benjamin, Freedom, and the Human Subject. He is the general editor of Oxford Studies in Philosophy and Literature, the editor of Stanley Cavell, and co-editor with Bernard Rie, or Rye, and I don't know if I got it right, of Stanley Cavell and Literary Studies. So thank you, Arata. Thanks, Richard. Uh, and you have the floor. Just let me know if you need anything. OK, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the introduction, Jonas, um, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. I'm very happy to be here, be be in this uh, virtual space uh, together with you all. Um, so, I uh, I have two handouts. Um, uh, one is a handout of passages. Um, the other is a handout which sort of gives the outline of the paper. Um, uh if you do have the outline of the paper um uh you know feel free to make use of it just kind of keep track of uh where i am in the presentation um i won't be referring to that explicitly very much um i will be like using the the handout of passages um as i uh go through the paper um the uh, I, the paper has actually changed its title sorry about that jonas i i I should have told you. Um, it's uh, instead of that very long title that Jonas just gave, um, I just have a very short title, just like Stanley Cavell and what we say, um, where the we say is italicized. Um, I'm sorry, I noticed that the uh, title was changed, but I wasn't sure if it was supposed to change the title of the conference. So sorry. Yeah, no. yeah, no, that's my fault. I should have, yeah, I, it's the same paper. It's just, you know, I just changed the title. Um, uh, so um, there's one feature that I'll, some of what I say is going to involve, um, like in writing, it involves the use of italics. And um, I, you know, I sort of blame Stanley Cavell for this. Um, uh, he um, is very fond of using italics to make, make points. In fact, some of the points he makes are very difficult to make without the use of italics, I think. Um, there's uh, an argument. There's a like the discussion of um, of Malcolm and uh, Albert on criteria. Um, uh, where like Cavell's response, I think, essentially involves the use of italics. There, um, my friend and colleague um, Kelly Jolly calls it the argument for italics. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I'm gonna like later on in the paper. I'm gonna like signal the italics by going like like this or something like that, just to indicate. Um, uh, OK, um, so, um, so what I want to do in this paper, or what I do in this paper, um, is uh, to explore the idea that the first person is internal to language, not just in the sense that um, language can be turned on oneself so that one can speak about oneself, but in the sense that any use of language um, whatever it is used to describe or represent um, has the first person inside it. So in something like um, a parallel with Kant's remark that it must be possible for the I think to accompany all of my representations, um, it can seem that the I say in all its speciations, the I tell, the I remind, the I advise, the I promise, and so on, um, must be able to accompany all of my linguistic representations. Um, and just as for Kant, 
I is not an object of thought, but is in some sense universal. Um, so there would seem to be a universal I that is not itself the object of language, um, a subject of discourse, but something like um, a pure linguistic I. Um, I think that the idea of the first person as constituted of language is pervasive in Cavell's thought. Um, and of course in Wittgenstein also. Um, and so what I want to do here is to explore its meaning and its ramifications. Um, so uh, this, um, I'm gonna read from passage number one um, to begin this presentation. So uh, in Aesthetic Problems of Modern Philosophy, um, Stanley Cavell writes, the philosopher appealing to everyday language turns to the reader not to convince him without proof, but to get him to prove something, test something against himself. He is saying, look and find out whether you can see what I see, wish to say what I wish to say. Of course, he often seems to answer or beg his own question by posing it in plural form. We say, we want to say, we can imagine, we feel as if we had to penetrate phenomena, repair a spider's web. We are under the illusion, we are dazzled, the idea now absorbs us, we are dissatisfied. But the plural is still first person. It is not to use Kant's word, postulate, that we, you and I, and he, say and want and imagine and feel and suffer together. Um, so what is the significance of Cavell's point that the plural we in the philosopher's appeals to everyday language is still first person? Um, that is the question I want to explore in this paper. Um, before I go further, I just want to like enter like sort of two caveats. One is that I'm going to be restricting my remarks to um, uh, the few early papers in Must We We Say that I mentioned, um, uh, and uh, parts one and two of the claim of reason. Um, although in, during discussion, I'm, I'm very happy to um, have anyone bring in, you know, uh, text from other writings of Pavel's. Um, uh, the other thing, um, and this I think might be a bit annoying to people, um, it's, it's a bit annoying to me actually, <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna be using like the phrase ordinary language philosopher rather indiscriminately um, in the way that I think some, sometimes Cavell does in, in especially in his earlier writings. Um, uh, but, you know, as you'll see, um, uh, I'll be drawing, you know, um, mostly on Wittgenstein, um, but I won't be sort of um, doing any work in, in trying to like make this like, comes under this phrase, ordinary language philosopher, ordinary language philosophy, uh, more specific um, uh, in this paper. Um, okay, so uh, Cavell points out here um, in the context of the passage that I just read, um, that the claims of the ordinary language philosopher cannot be backed by a proof. Um, and for Cavell, the cannot here is logical, not empirical. Um, absence of a proof isn't a deficiency in them, but rather shows what kind of claim it is. Um, a feature Cavell thinks that links them with aesthetic judgments, which is one of the topics in, of course, in aesthetic problems of modern philosophy. Um, with a claim regarding a matter of fact, you might be unnerved by the fact that others don't agree with you. You may find yourself needing to reconsider the support for your belief in order to assuage your doubts. But it is certainly conceivable that after further reflection on the evidence, you continue to maintain your claim. But this agreement with respect to the claims of the ordinary language philosopher, which I'm just gonna call for short like OLP. Um, so uh, this agreement with respect to the claims of the OLP has a different character and has different consequences. Um, Cavell writes, quote, about what we say when we do not expect to have, uh, to have to tolerate much difference believing that if we could articulate it fully, we would have spoken for all men, found the necessities common to all. Uh, that's passage number three, as you can see. Um, and if we haven't, if I've not spoken for everyone on a matter of knowledge, we disagree on what is so. That does not impugn the possibility of my speaking to them on matters of knowledge. But if I have failed to speak for others with regard to the OLP's appeals to what we say, my ability to speak to another on a matter of knowledge, or for that matter on anything, is placed under threat. 
In the availability of Wittgenstein's later philosophy, another early but pivotal essay in his corpus, Cavell writes, um, this is uh, passage number four, we who can speak for another find that we cannot speak for them. In part, of course, we find, that, find this out in finding that we cannot speak to them. If speaking for someone else seems to be a mysterious process, that may be because speaking to someone does not seem mysterious enough, unquote. Um, the universal purport of we needs to be distinguished from the objectivity of truth, from the idea that what is true is true independently of what anyone thinks. The objectivity of truth requires that what one thinks is independent of one's thinking it. Thus, what one thinks does not seem to have the first person within it. It is essentially first impersonal. As of course, you know, many philosophers um, like Frege have stressed, um, but the first person is inlimitable in the LLP's remarks regarding what we say. In his paper, must, must we mean what we say? Cavell comments on this point in connection with the statement. When we ask whether an action is voluntary, we imply that the action is fishy. So that this is um, a remark that uh, Ryle um, made uh, uh, regarding um, you know, the meaning of the term voluntary as, as used in a question. Um, uh, Cavell calls this remark S um, in passage number five. And he writes there, however difficult it is to make out a case for the necessity of S, it is important that the temptation to call it a priori not be ignored. Otherwise we will acquiesce in calling it synthetic, which would be badly misleading. The feeling that S must be synthetic comes of course, partly from the fact that it obviously is not likely to be taken as analytic, but it also comes from the ease with which S may be mistaken for the statement is X voluntary implies that X is fishy, which Cavell labels T, which does, not, which does seem obviously synthetic. But S and T, though they are true together and false together, are not everywhere interchangeable. The identical state of affairs is described by both, but a person who may be entitled to say T may not be entitled to say S. Only a native speaker of English is entitled to the statement S whereas a linguist describing English may, though he is not a native speaker of English, be entitled to T. What entitles him to T is his having gathered a certain amount and kind of evidence in its favor, but the person entitled to S is not entitled to that statement for the same reason. He needs no evidence for it, but there's nothing he needs, and there is no evidence, which it makes sense in general to say he has. The question of evidence is irrelevant." Unquote. This passage can be regarded as an elaboration on Cavell's remark that the OLP does not postulate that we, you and I, and he say and want and imagine and feel and suffer together. That was from uh, the first quote I read. That is, his appeals to what we say are not to be understood as hypotheses or inferences, either from one's own case or from the observation of other speakers. In fact, the OLP's remarks concerning what we say are not to be understood as factual statements about a given group of speakers, however wide the net is cast, to all human beings, to all persons, even to all rational beings. For if it were, we could be replaced with a suitable third person term. Given the commonly assumed dichotomy between the descriptive and the normative, it may be tempting to conceive of the OLP statements as normative, not statements about what we do, will, or would say, but statements about what we ought to say. Um, you know, that would be perhaps a way of um, finessing the dichotomy between analytic and synthetic that, that uh, Cabell brings up in, in the passage I just read. Um, but I think that mischaracterizes the nature of the OLP's appeals. For we must understand those appeals as lying at the limit of the distinction between the normative and the descriptive. The very idea of the normative presupposes that we can make sense of a violation of the norm. For example, suppose that it is a norm of gift exchange, that if one receives a gift, one is obliged to return a gift of roughly the same value. But how would we describe a situation in which someone immediately returned the gift she was giving, thinking that by doing so, she would be conforming to that norm? 
Would such a person have violated norms regarding gift giving? It will seem rather that such a person evinces a lack of understanding of what a gift is and what giving a gift is. I can give you norms of gift giving, but I can't say what counts as giving a gift so as to ward off all such possible failures of conformity to the norms of the practice of gift exchange. Um, this is passage number eight. Now, uh, Jonadas, if you can um, scroll down to eight. Thanks. Um, you cannot use words to do what we do with them until you are initiate of the forms of life, which give those words the point and shape they have in our lives. When I give you directions, I can deduce only exterior facts about directions. For example, I can say, not that road, the other, the one passing the clabbered houses, and be sure to bear left at that railroad crossing. But I cannot say what directions are in order to get you to go the way I'm pointing, nor say what my direction is. If that means saying something which is not a further specification of my direction, but as it were, cuts below the actual pointing to something which makes my pointing finger point. Unquote. The LLP statements regarding what we say articulate those commonalities of mind that are a condition of following this or that rule or norm and are not themselves to be cast as rules or norms. Thus, the indicative form is essential to the nature of the OLP statements. Apart from these commonalities, the rule itself begins to stammer. The pointing finger ceases to point. Wittgenstein famously wrote, I, if I've exhausted the justifications, I've reached bedrock and my spade is turned, then I'm inclined to say, this is simply what I do. Um, of course, this, this remark um, has perhaps um, been the most discussed um, remark, uh, anyways, late um, in uh, Wittgenstein's investigations. Um, notice he doesn't say, I'm inclined to say, this is simply what one ought to do. Nor should the statement be understood as reporting a psychological fact about oneself, um, as I think um, Saul Kripke interprets it. Um, the statement, this is simply what I do, is inseparable from one's exercising the capacity whose very exercise is the subject of the report, and so is recognizable by another only insofar as she recognizes it as the exercise of her own capacity to follow a rule. While indicative, this is simply what I do, is not an empirical description. Um, it is neither an empirical description nor normative, but it's to be located in a register where that distinction breaks down. It is an ex exhibition of the use, and it is the use itself that is normative. Um, so this is, um, uh, I don't know if I have this passage. Could you scroll down a little bit? Um, yeah, passage number 12. Um, Cavell writes um, there, the normativeness which mates felt and which is certainly present does not lie in the ordinary language philosopher's assertions about ordinary use. What is normative is exactly ordinary use itself. Um, and then in the next passage, number 13, um, Cavell writes, when Wittgenstein, or at this stage, any philosopher appealing to ordinary language says what we say, what he produces is, is not a generalization, though he may later generalize, but a supposed instance of what we say. We may think of it as a sample. Um, the introduction of the sample by the words we say is an invitation for you to see whether you have such a sample or can accept mine as a sound one. Um, uh, one sample does not refute or disconfirm another. If two are in disagreement, they vie with one another for the same confirmation. The only source of confirmation is ourselves. Um, so it's essential to these statements then that they are, as Cavell puts it, easily mistaken for their synthetic counterparts for an empirical hypothesis or generalization. And they're easily mistaken for their synthetic counterparts because I say and I think are easily mistaken for higher order representations of representational acts. But to conceive of the first person thus is to miss the point of Cavell's insistence on the essentially first person character of the LLP's statements. Um, for Cavell, this is simply what I do, is not issued as an ultimatum in the spirit of my way or the highway or a statement of fact but as an invitation of sorts, as he puts it, a matter of making ourselves exemplary. 
While to be believedness, the content of a thought, does not essentially involve others, to be endorsedness essentially does. They are not claims about a community, but as Cavell puts it, claims to community. They are essentially addressed to others. Of course, it may be objected that if what Wittgenstein says is true, we can never explain how a child learns a language in the first place. In a certain sense, that's right, at least on a certain philosophical understanding of what an explanation would consist in. But what Cavell takes from this point is not that it raises a difficulty in explaining how a child learns language. Rather, he takes to show that in learning a language, the child is not simply learning the meaning of words. Uh, this is quote number, um, uh, 17. It's, uh, I skipped a bit of the, the paper here. Um, so yeah, so in, in learning language, you learn not merely what the names of things are, but what a, what a name is, not merely what the form of expression is for expressing a wish, but what expressing a wish is, not merely what the word for father is, but what a father is, not merely what the word for love is, but what love is. In learning language, you do not merely learn the pronunciation of sounds and their grammatical orders, but the forms of life which make those sounds the words they are, do what they do. For example, name, call, point, express a wish or affection, indicate a choice or an aversion, etc. Um, if that is right, there's a lot that is already packed into any single act of saying, of naming, claiming, asking, requesting, ordering, etc. These could be called implications or particular acts of saying, but importantly, they are not logical in the sense of deductive implications of the meaning of the words that are employed in their specific combination, though they are nonetheless necessary implications in a broader sense of logic than deductive logic, necessary conditions of the coherence of my act of saying. It is this that the OLP's claims about what we say are meant to articulate. Uh, this passage number 19, um, please, thanks. Um, Cavell writes, learning what these implications are is part of learning the language, no less a part than learning its syntax or learning what it is to which terms apply. They are an essential part of what we communicate when we talk. Intimate understanding is understanding which is implicit. Nor could everything we say mean to communicate in normal communication be said explicitly. Otherwise, the only threat to communication would be acoustical. We are therefore exactly as responsible for the specific implications of our utterances as we are for their explicit factual claims." Um, so let me, this, that's, um, the first part of this two-part presentation. Um, uh, sorry. Let me just um, sum up that part with the following. So the OLP's um, appeals to what we say is not transparent to deliberation regarding what to believe, as is I believe or I judge, but at the same time, they're not psychological or sociological statements about a given group of speakers or thinkers, nor are they expressions, expressions of psychological or sociological facts about a given group of speakers. For example, facts about their intentions or conventions that they have, that they have adopted. Agreement on what we say is, as Cavell puts it, a condition of our speaking to one another, conditions of recognizing someone as having said or thought something. That places the OLP's appeals to what we say in the space of the transcendental, what belongs to the limit of language, the limit of thought, although obviously it is, it is a delicate matter how to understand the notion of limit here. So the second part of this paper, the first part, I think I might have neglected saying, um, the first part, uh, uh, called the grammatical features of what we say. Um, and the second part is called the, the transcendental we, um, question mark, Cavell and Davis. Um, so I just mentioned the OLP's remarks concerning what we say, stake out the limits of language or the limits of thought. 
What lies on the other side of the OLPs we say, uh, we say is not another way of speaking, an alternative language, or another way of thinking, an alternative conceptual scheme, but nothing at all, nonsense. By Kant's, I think, the OLPs we say is transcendental, or so it seems. In characterizing the transcendental character of what he calls Wittgenstein's idealism, uh, Bernard Williams writes, and this is uh, passage number 21, So I'm, this is a rather long passage, but I'll, I'll read it because I'm, the rest of the paper is really kind of a commentary on this passage. Um, Since the fact that our language is such and such, and thus that the world we live in is as it is, are as presently construed transcendental facts. They have no empirical explanation. Anything that can be empirically explained is that certain external features of the world are this way rather than that, or that we, opposed to the Hopi Indians, or again, as opposed to cats, see things in a certain way, all these fall within the world of our language and are not the transcendental facts. In particular, in the sense in, in which we are now speaking of our language, there could be no explanation of it or correlation of it with the world in sociological terms or zoological or materialistic in any of the several current senses of that expression. However, while we could not explain it in any of those ways, we could in a way make it clearer to ourselves by reflecting on it, as it were, self-consciously exercising it. Not indeed by considering alternatives, for what I'm presently considering can have no comprehensible alternatives to it, but by moving around reflectively inside our view of things and sensing when one began to near the edge by the increasing comprehensibility, uh, sorry, by the increasing incomprehensibility of things regarded from whatever way out point of view one has moved into. What one would become conscious of and so reflecting is something like how we go on. Um, so of course, like the how we go on sort of echoes, you know, Wittgenstein's famous, um, this is what I do. Right? Uh, the contrast William draws here, William draws here between empirical and transcendental is similar to the one that Cavell makes between the statements of the OLP and the statements of the empirical linguists. Empirical idealism is the view that truth is a function of facts that could be empirically discovered about us, understood as the empirical linguist understands us, namely as this group of people. Uh, and relativism can be regarded as the aggregative version of empirical idealism. By contrast, limits of the transcendental we are to be reached by, as Williams puts it, moving around reflectively inside our view of things and sensing when one began to near the edge. Um, I want in the rest of this paper to focus on what this might mean. Um, what is meant by inside our view of things? Um, does it mean inside our beliefs about things? Does it mean inside what we mean in saying the things we do? Williams evidently means something like the latter since the supposed transcendental facts that he talks about are facts about our language, not about our thought or beliefs, at least not in the first instance. Um, and since these facts are transcendental, they are facts about the world as well. The world is thus our world in the transcendental sense. But what is the relevant conception of meaning here? Perhaps a logical principle, such as the principle of non-contradiction, has a sort of transcendental standing that Williams may have in mind. It is difficult to construe it either as the content of a belief or as a normative requirement. It seems hard to cast it as the content of a belief since it is difficult to grasp its opposite. And it seems hard to cast it as a norm of belief formation since it is difficult to countenance a failure to observe the norm. There seems to be an intimate connection between holding the principle of non-contradiction and believing anything at all. The principle of non-contradiction seems to belong to the universal I think that is a condition of the empirical I think, a condition of someone's having particular beliefs. It constitutes the unity of mind, both my own and between my mind and other minds, that is a condition of having representations of objects and is not itself a representation of an object. This gives expression to the necessity of the principle of non-contradiction. The transcendental standing of this principle gives expression to how it could both be a principle of thought and figure as a constraint on truth. 
It expresses the limit of thought. It is not itself a content of thought. Donald Davidson patterns his response to the skeptic about our knowledge of the external world on such reflections on the transcendental standing of the principle of non-contradiction. For Davidson, the objective validity of the principles of logic rests on the fact that they are what must be held in common as a condition of mutual comprehension between speakers. Following Quine, he writes, and this is um, passage number 22, the only and therefore unimpeachable method available to the interpreter automatically puts the speaker's beliefs in accord with the standards of logic of the interpreter and hence credits the speaker with the plain truths of logic." Unquote. Davidson extends this point about logical truth to truth in general. This is uh, the next passage, number 23. Um, analogously, it is impossible for an interpreter to be largely wrong about the world, for the interpreter interprets sentences held true, which is not to be distinguished from attributing beliefs. According to the events and objects in the outside world, the cause of sentence to be held true." Unquote. He argues that it is difficult and even impossible to countenance ascribing beliefs to someone whose beliefs are in the main false, and thus that it is transcendentally necessary that the bulk of our beliefs are true. The fact that Davidson conceives of the transcendental argument he gives as an extension of the principle of non-contradiction is revealing from our point of view. The principle of non-contradiction governs a possible content of thought. No thought that violates the principle of non-contradiction is a coherent thought. Similarly, Davison argues that agreement in so veridicality of belief is a condition on the description of coherent thought. Without agreement in so veridicality of the preponderance of our beliefs, it is impossible to ascribe meaning to speech acts of assertion. Davidson can be viewed, then, as following out Williams' idea of moving around reflectively inside our view of things and sensing when one began to near the edge, as Williams put it. We begin to near the edge when we try to ascribe beliefs to another that in the main differ from our own. And what we realize when we do this is not just that we cannot help but project agreement with our own beliefs in the interpretation of others, our being unable to do so is not just a fact about us and our own limitations, whether we conceive of those limitations as empirical or transcendental. What we discover is not that we are stuck behind the veil of our own beliefs or together you know, with others in a, like a communal veil of beliefs, um, but that there is a limit to the intelligibility of the very idea of mass of error. And so what we discover on Davison's argument is that non-veridicality presupposes a background of veridicality. The veridical I think is prior to the non-veridical I think, or I know is prior to I don't know. The objective is prior to the subjective. Um, call this doxastic disjunctivism. But what Davidson means by meaning, I think, is not what Cavell means. Um, and so what for Cavell would count as, quote, moving around reflectively inside our view th of things, unquote, must be understood differently. So, so what I'm gonna do in uh, um, the rest of the paper and um, nearing the end um, is to uh, contrast, you know, David's, uh, like Cavell's way um, or what I'm contending would be like Cavell's way of interpreting that claim of Bernard Williams. Of course, Cavell doesn't do so explicitly. Um, I'm suggesting that it might be helpful to think of Cavell as doing so um, uh, and to like, contrast, so to speak, the Cavellian interpretation of that remark from uh, Williams with the Davidsonian interpretation of that remark. Um, so Cavell follows Austin in looking at what we say as the guiding ground in assessing the skeptic's progress. However, it is a point of emphasis in Cavell that the turn to ordinary language in philosophers like Austin and Wittgenstein should not be understood as a new way of doing conceptual analysis, of finding out what words or concepts, particularly those words or concepts on which philosophical issues have turned, 
such as know, perceive, act, intend, promise, and so on, really mean. This way of understanding the turn to ordinary language has, subjective, has subjected ordinary language philosophy to the objection, and in some quarters ridicule, that attention to what we say when is able to reveal at most the conditions under which it is reasonable to use words such as I know, I perceive, I intend, um, not the conditions under which those statements would be true. In the case of no, it would seem that the most that attention to ordinary language could show from the perspective of the traditional epistemologist is what we know for all practical purposes. That is, what we can be said to know once we factor in the pragmatic considerations that no doubt play an essential role in determining whether someone's claim to know is reasonably made. But as the traditional epistemologist will be quick to point out, it is possible that we know for all practical purposes in that sense, without knowing simpliciter, without it being true that we know. Um, Cavell calls such an appeal to what we say a direct criticism of the skeptic, an approach, of course, that he roundly rejects. Um, uh, Cavell writes, um, in the work of Wittgenstein and Austin, this is uh, quote number 24, um, appeals to what we ordinarily say take on a different emphasis. In them, the emphasis is less on the ordinariness of an expression than on the fact that they are said, or of course written by human beings to human beings in definite contexts in a language they share, hence the obsession with the use of expressions. And then uh, in the next passage, number 26, um, Cavell continues, Wittgenstein's motive, and this, this much is shared by Austin, is to put the human animal back into language and therefore back into philosophy. Um, that was the original title of my paper. Um, he, under, he undertook, as I read him, to trace the mechanisms of this re rejection in the ways in which in investigating ourselves, we are led to speak outside language games, consider expressions apart from in a, and in opposition to the natural forms of life which give those expressions the force they have. What is left out of an expression, if it is used outside its ordinary language game, is not necessarily what the words mean. They may mean what they always did, what a good dictionary says they mean, but what we mean in using them, when and where we do, the point of saying them is lost. The distinction between a certain combination of words lacking meaning and my failing to mean anything by my words is pivotal. I can fail to say something, fall into what Cavell calls an illusion of meaning in either of these ways. There are two different ways of, to invoke Williams's words, coming near and falling off the edge of sense. I can fail to know what I mean because I fail to know what the sentence I'm using means or I can fail to know what I mean because I fail to mean the sentence I'm using, even a sentence whose meaning I know. This implies that what one says is not separable from one saying what one says. That is, we should not understand the act of saying as an add-on to a proposition, that to a so-called proposition that has meaning independently of the act of saying, of someone's meaning it. Rather, there's a recognizable proposition only inside a recognizable act of someone saying what she does and meaning it. You might think of Cavell as widening Frege's context principle, or perhaps as articulating what was always implicit within it. Um, the, the above distinction in ways of uh, hallucinating meaning is pivotal in Cavell's invocation of the idea of a non-claim context in his treatment of skepticism. And I, I'm sure you talked about, I mean, I, I gather you talked about this in connection with um, Jonah's paper um, earlier in the conference. Um, the skeptic needs to bring under examination a particular knowledge claim if the path of reflection he follows is to proceed fully naturally as it seems to do. But the knowledge claim he needs must be conceived of in a special way. It must be conceived of as a best case for knowing anything about the world at all. Only thus can a conclusion that is reached about this claim have a bearing on our ability to know things about the world considered as a whole. But the requirement that the particular claim under consideration must be representative, 
must bear the weight of standing in for all of our knowledge considered as a whole, conflicts, Cavell argues, with the need to have a possible knowledge claim in view. This is because it is, Cavell maintains, a condition of performing an act that would count as making a claim that, quote, this is uh, number 28, um, there must in grammar be re reasons for what you say or be point in your saying of something if what you say is to be, in, uh, is to be comprehensible, unquote. However, if there is a point to your claim, it will be in Thompson's Clark's words, implained. Conclusions reached about the validity of the claim would fail to extend to the validity of our knowledge as a whole. So, you know, Cavell then formulates the dilemma of the traditional investigation of knowledge um, in a way that, that I, I think that probably all of you are very familiar with this passage. Um, uh, there's, there's a conflict between um, two desires that, um, uh, that traditional philosophers has. One is for, or two, two needs, you know, the, the traditional philosopher has to satisfy. Um, it must be the investigation of a concrete claim if this procedure is to be coherent. It cannot be the investigation of a concrete claim if this conclusion is to be general. Um, So um, in, in the paper, uh, you know, I discussed this in point in more detail in connection with um, uh, the phrase, you know, see all of the object. Um, and uh, for, uh, Fernando um, I characterized this, uh, um, these passages well, so I won't um, read those passages, uh, but, but I will like proceed like directly to uh, what I take to be the lesson of the passages. Um, so prescinding from the criteria that figure in ordinary context, when we use the phrase, see all of it, is to prescind from what brings the world into view. That is, it is to prescind from that alignment between language and the world that is a condition of making claims about it. Claims such as, I see all of the object, or I know that there is a green jar of pencils on the desk. In seeking to assess our knowledge from the outside, the skeptical philosopher no longer has the world so much as so much as in view. There is nothing that is the, an object of his claims. He's no longer speaking about anything. He is, um, as Cavell puts it, distorting our concept of an object überhaupt. The criteria for applying see all of it are not part of the meaning of see all of it, but condition the possibility of applying see all of it to the world. These criteria are not part of the meaning of the phrase, do not belong to the logical in the sense of deductive logic or implications of using the phrase, but are nonetheless part of what we learn in learning a language, no less a part of what we learn in the sense and reference of words. Thus, quote, moving around reflectively inside our view of things, unquote, is for Cavell, not a matter of moving around reflectively inside of what can be coherently said, as it is for Davidson and perhaps for Williams, um, but a matter of moving, moving around reflectively inside of what can be coherently said. Um, I, I neglected to use the hand signals for um, italics. Um, uh, the difference lies where the italics are placed. And what is the relevance of this difference? Um, so we have, you know, moving around effectively inside of what can be coherently said, where the what is entirely divorced from the conditions of saying what is said, um, versus a matter of moving around effectively inside of what can be coherently said, where that also pertains to what can be said. Um, but now you're thinking of, or Cavell is thinking of what one says in the saying of what one says as a, as a sort of inseparable unity, um, not as a like a accidental complex, but as an essential unity. Um, so I presented both Davidson and Cavell as inheriting Kant's transcendental approach to understanding the possibility of what Kant called the relation between representation and object. Both extend Kant's transcendental, I think, to the inner subjective. Just as Kant argued that the I think must be able to accompany all of my representations, 
They argue that the we think or the we say must be able to accompany all of my representations, at least at the limit. Both hold that the first person is ineliminable in explaining the relation between representation and object, for we can only understand language and thought from inside language and thought, from inside one's capacity to speak and to think. But this point has a different upshot for each philosopher. For each understands differently the medium, so to speak, the one is reflectively to move around inside. For Davidson, the skeptic is found to be unintelligible once we see that the possibility of massive error in belief is unintelligible. That is the point at which we reach the edge of what we can comprehend. For Cavell, the skeptic is found to be unintelligible once we see that the skeptic cannot claim, cannot say what he needs to claim or to say. It is there where the skeptic has reached the edge of what we can comprehend. It is implicit in Davidson's view that the world comes into view in our representations through the sense and meaning of our words and concept. But, and this is where we can locate what I think is both most elusive and, and most interesting in the vision that Cavell is offering. For Cavell, the world coming into view requires agreement on the criteria of what counts as applying concepts and words to the world, where that is not something that is implied by the meaning of the concepts and words. Um, if Kant is a precursor of Cavell, it is a Kant of the third critique. What Cavell calls criteria seem to belong to what Kant calls the power of judgment. For Cavell, my relation to the world as a whole is not through representation. The world as a whole is rather shown in the act of saying, in, in what counts as an act of saying. Um, this is one way of interpreting what, what he calls the truth of skepticism. My relation to the world and to others in general is not one of knowing. So from Cavell's perspective, Davidson has not succeeded in putting the human animal back into language and therewith back into philosophy. And he hasn't done so because he has in his account of, me of the meeting of minds in linguistic communication, as subtle and in some ways profound as it is, neglected altogether what Cavell calls the coherence of what I, what I mean or what I say. For Davidson, the relevance of the act of assertion, the need to identify such performances in the situation of radical interpretation is that it gives the interpreter a window onto the speaker's attitudes of holding true. Thus, sharing a world with others is a matter of sharing our beliefs about what is so. But for, but for Cavell, we share a world insofar as we share criteria for what counts as telling someone something, making a request, issuing a command, and so on, doing all those things that can only be done in language. It is in sharing such criteria, in agreeing on the OLP's claims about what we say, that we can agree or disagree with regard to propositions. It is only on the basis of such shared criteria that we can, to use terms from the Tractatus, recognize the symbol in the sign. This is the last paragraph. Um, this point is related to another important difference. Davidson's situation of radical interpretation is not one in which one person addresses another, but is rather one in which someone who is observing an act of address is trying to discern what the speaker means and believes. Although, it is not the position of the linguist looking on from the outside. It is still fundamentally third personal. For Davidson, the idea of an objective world is necessarily the third term of a triangulate, what, of what, what Davidson calls a triangulation between at least two thinkers. Language is essential in the relation between thought and world because it is only through interpreting the speech of another that I can, that I can ascribe beliefs to the other and so ascribe beliefs to myself since, as Davidson argues, I have a conception of that of which my beliefs are about, only insofar as I think of the objects of my beliefs as that which is the common object of our beliefs. Cavell takes the situation of one person addressing another as you to be fundamental, for it is an address that the speaker makes herself responsible to another, um, assumes responsibility for what she says, and for the coherence of her meaning, what she says. Um, I just read this morning um, Eric's paper in which I think he, he nicely develops the, the importance of um, assuming responsibility in, uh, for Cavell and the dialectic of, of skepticism, of his dialectic of his response to skepticism. Uh, for Cavell, we have a world only as a participant in address. 
The world is not that which is shared by an I and he or she or they, but I and you or we. For Davidson, the object is a third person, is a third term in a triangle whose other terms are I and she or he. For Cavell, the object is the third term in a triangle whose other terms are I and you. It is only inside the Cavellian triangle that each term can be what it is. It is only inside the Cavellian triangle that there can be a we, a meeting of minds rather than just a matching of them. For all his talk of shared beliefs, Davison doesn't really explain how it could be that we can know, reason, and act together, how we can constitute ourselves as we. This is something that can only be done in language, it would seem. But acts of speech then must be seen not just as windows onto our psychological states, but as the vehicle by which we bind ourselves to one another and so thereby constitute a we. The we say constitutes the possibility of addressing and so binding oneself in the act of address to someone. For Cavell, I say and we say are not representations, but rather express the act of committing oneself to one's addressee, taking responsibility for making sense. It is only inside acts of taking responsibility for what I say and what we say that the world comes into view. You could say then that Davidson doesn't take on the other half of what Cavell formulates as a truth, as a truth of skepticism. My relation to others in general is not one of knowing, but, acknowledge, but of acknowledging. And so from Cavell's perspective, in so doing, Davidson falls into what Cavell calls skepticism. I'll stop there. So, so I'm sorry I went on too long. No, that's fine. Thank you, Arat. We are on time. So Professor Richard, would you like to take the word? Good, yes. Am I audible to everyone? Yes. Good. Um, well, let me begin by saying I think I have no disagreement at all uh, with Arata, with his accounts of the character of the statements made by the ordinary language philosopher about what we say, or about language learning and what it involves, or about the idea that competence in using language thinking and speaking inherently includes speaking to others with a point. So that's to say, I think I agree with what the most important parts of the paper are almost entirely. Um, what I will do is concentrate on the contrast with Davidson, which I would not draw in exactly the way that Arata would, though I agree there are important contrasts there. So let's think about that. Arata aptly and usefully compares and contrasts Cavell on language, thought, belief, and action centrally with Kant, Bernard Williams, and especially Donald Davidson. Like Kant, Williams, and Davidson, Cavell is concerned, as Arata puts it, with a condition of having representations of objects at all, a condition that extends as well to the having of beliefs and thoughts and to the speaking of a language. Both Davidson and Cavell, as he puts it, inherit Kant's transcendental approach to understanding the possibility of what Kant called the relation between representation and object. The issue then is what is in fact necessary in order to do all that, to represent objects, have beliefs and thoughts, and speak a language. For Davidson, there is one primary such necessary condition. In order to think, believe, or represent objects under concepts at all, one must be interpretable by another through the empirical construction of a T theory, that is, a theory of the truth conditions contributing role played by each expression of the interpretant's language. The empirical construction of a T theory in turn requires and implies that the interpretant largely obey the canons of logic, use the compositional devices of the first order predicate calculus in constructing complex expressions out of atomic ones, and share a great majority of beliefs with the interpreter. If I understand him correctly, Arada does not exactly object to Davidson's story about these necessary conditions for being thus interpretable, and hence for having beliefs, thoughts, or conceptual representations. Instead, he regards it as both incomplete, hence inadequate, and as coming too close to a theory of mental representation. In contrast, Cavell has little interest in a formally structured semantic theory. 
Ian Davidson, Cavell stresses, in contrast, that a genuine thinker, believer, and speaker of a language must be a member of the human form of life, including having manifold shared interests and modes of responsiveness to the world and to others. Second, a genuine thinker must display that responsiveness in speech behavior, wherein responsibility for the pragmatics of one's utterances or for how one is understood is acknowledged and discharged. To cite one useful example of Cavell's that Arata does not mention, suppose I ask you, would you like to borrow my scooter? And you reply, sure, I'll have a go. If I then reply, oh no, I wasn't offering it to you. I was simply inquiring into your state of mind. I am then failing to discharge my responsibility to you, failing to take responsibility for how I will be understood by you in having said those words then, where what will normally and rightly be understood by you and offer outruns the mere semantics of the words used. Roughly, I fail to mean what I said in saying those words, even though the words themselves thus combined were fully meaningful and did not say, include the phrase, I hereby offer you. In doing that, I fail in my relationship to you. That is, if I fail to take responsibility for how the saying of my words there and then will normally and rightly be understood. I fail in my relationship to you. If this happens often enough, then I am just as unintelligible to you and as unintelligible in general as a thinker, believer, and speaker, as if I violated the canons of logic or the requirement of being interpretable under an empirically constructed T theory. Transcendental necessities of thought extend, one might say, beyond logic and semantics into matters of human relationship and uptake in communicative action. It is, as Arata might put it, not just contingent that we happen after thinking and believing to turn out mostly to share modes of responsiveness to the world and to others in communicative action. It is rather necessary for being a thinking, believing, language speaking subject at all. That is, that we share modes of responsiveness to others and to communicative action with others. Responsiveness to the other, accepted and discharged in communicative interaction, is part of the whole package. All of this, every bit of it, seems to me true and important. The comparison with Davidson is apt, as is the stress on the significance of responsible communicative interaction with other subjects for Cavell. Like Arata, I think Cavell is right to stress this and that this stress has enormous implications for how we understand thought, language, belief, meaning, and action, for how we understand being a subject in the relevant sense at all. Arata goes on to extend Cavell's story to an analysis of skepticism. The problem with the skeptic is not that his words are meaningless. It is rather that he cannot be coherently understood as making a genuine claim about how things in particular are to another subject, or in Cavell's words that Arata cites, the skeptic's procedures must be the investigation of a concrete claim if its procedure is to be coherent. That is, it must be the kind of claim, the truth of which we can investigate and deduce evidence for and against, such as, for example, there is cheese in the cupboard, just look and see. But to go on, it cannot be the investigation of a concrete claim if its conclusion is to be general. That is, the insinuation entered, maybe an evil demon is deceiving me, must have implications for all knowledge claims rather than being the kind of thing we can investigate and induce evidence for and against in more or less ordinary ways. All this too, this set of reflections about skepticism is both authentic Cavell and important. And the fundamental thought being that the skeptic is not responsibly entering a genuinely discussable claim to another subject. I have now, however, two questions about all of this, the second of which is perhaps more important than the first. 
Uh, the first question has to do with Davidson and semantic theory. Uh, it might be of some interest to people to know that I was, in fact, for a brief time, a student of Davidson's, uh, but never a student of Cavell's, in fact. Uh, <laughs> it seems to me to be worth remarking that Davidson is perhaps less distant from Cavell and Wittgenstein and Ryle, in one way at least, than Arata perhaps suggests. What I mean is that for Davidson, semantic and epistemic attitudes assigning truth condition contributions to expressions, those are semantic attitudes, and having beliefs or actually holding some sentences to be true, those are epistemic attitudes, are for Davidson themselves essentially theoretical entities. They are postulated by the interpreter in order to make intelligible the speech behavior of the interpretant. They are in no way entities in mind, in fact, as I'm going to go on to say, Davidson rejects the whole idea of the mind as traditionally considered. Hence, Davidson is fundamentally interested in understanding the distinctive multiple attitude expressing actions of subjects in the world, not in any kind of representation that is divorced from action. This is clear enough, I think, in his rejection of the very idea of a conceptual scheme that is distinct from having a set of largely apt commitments to how the world is that are displayed in action. And here's a passage from On the Very Idea of a Conceptual Scheme. Davidson writes, there are, for example, theories that make freedom consist in decisions taken apart from all desires, habits, and dispositions of the agent, and theories of knowledge that suggest that the mind can observe the totality of its own perceptions and ideas. In each case, the mind is divorced from the traits that constitute it. A familiar enough conclusion to certain lines of reasoning, as I said, but one that should always persuade us to reject the consequences. So actions involve inherently desires, habits, and dispositions. Decisions involve all those. Um, interaction with the world is involved in having perceptions and ideas. He goes on, Languages we will not think of as separable from souls. Speaking a language is not a trait a man can lose while retaining the power of thought. This becomes even more explicit in his later paper, um, Thought and Talk. Here, the traits that do constitute the mind, according to Davidson, are the actualization in worldly action of a rational capacity or power to produce behavior that expressly expresses richly structured propositional attitudes of all kind. Absent that actualization in action, there is no thought. So Davidson is, after all, a kind of neo-Aristotelian. Having a rational soul is not separable from speaking a language, actually speaking it in practice in the world. This, I think, puts paid to the idea that Arada alludes to briefly, that utterances are for Davidson a window onto the mind of others. That I think isn't right. The window onto the mind part suggests mind as prior interior space of representation. And that's what I'm taking Davidson to be rejecting. So in this respect, this much connection with practice and activity in the world is required. Um, Davidson is closer to Cavell than Arata supposes. The point about the difference centering around responsiveness to others remains, however, and is vitally important. One reason for making this point is now to ask, is there any point to having a systematic semantic theory of the kind Davidson puts forward, in particular, to the idea that an empirically constructed T theory under the appropriate formal constraints might illuminate something about the nature of our semantic and cognitive capacities. Again, this will not be a description of entities in mind, nor will it be any kind of processing theory. Instead, it will be an elucidatory description of what we do in speaking that stresses the fact that our utterances and our performances in using them manifest a systematic structure. Words and their syntactic and semantic features are there, I think, before any individual object is. And we must somehow latch on to these features, features that can be systematically characterized, even if that systematic characterization of our semantic competence is an incomplete characterization of our overall linguistic competence and competence in thinking. 
these features can be systematically characterized and we must latch on to them in order to speak and think successfully, in order to play the game. Uh, Emma Borg's book, 2012, Pursuing Meaning, is a good defense of this line of Davidsonian thinking against radical contextualism, supposedly inspired by Wittgenstein, in the style of Reconati or Travis, Francois Reconati or Charles Travis. This seems to me, at any rate, to be a point that Cavell perhaps missed, and I wonder what Arata thinks about this. The second question, perhaps more importantly, Arata's citation of the claim of reason on the skeptic's dilemma, the incoherent need for both a claim context and a non-claim context, where you can't have both at once, seems to present this dilemma as a refutation of skepticism or as something like the last word on its incoherence. I wonder how this squares with Cavell on the truth of skepticism. Uh, in listening to Rada, I'm not so sure he was as committed uh, to the idea that this counts as a refutation as I'm making it out to be here. Um, what I'm really going to ask for is more on what he thinks the truth of skepticism looks like. So incoherent the skeptic's procedure may be, I think. What the skeptic says is certainly not just another argument of the kind that might pop up in daily life, or at least in daily life unfreighted with crisis. But Cavell, I think, takes us also all to be prone to crisis, to overwhelming experiences of being unable to fit into the world and with others, smoothly and with assurance in one's action and thus prone further to flee from such crises and from engagement with others into some claim to some perfect knowledge within, as well as into actions such as Othello's that express this flight. In the grip of this kind of existential anxiety, however it happens, and for Cavell, it does happen. It just doesn't happen by argument. However it happens, the words of the skeptic, however incoherent, will present themselves as, as apt as any words could be to capture one's situation. And the way out will then be through a restoration of trust in the world and in some others in it, however, wherever, and to whatever extent that is possible. And that's a good question. How, wherever, when, and to what extent is the restoration of trust in the world and in others possible? Or my money pursuits of happiness is actually the most interesting answer to that question. So now I wonder what Arata thinks about all this. Does he or doesn't he retain some hope that with the right understanding of thought and language, we might refute skepticism? Or must we somehow accept and acknowledge the truth of skepticism, live with it, and live our ways out of it as best we can in practice without ever quite knowing others or the world absolutely. Good, that's what I've got. So a question about Davidson and a question about what the truth of skepticism looks like. Well, thank you so much for that, Richard. Um, uh, there's, yeah, that's, um, that was great. I um I uh I'm I'm not sure Jonas, do you want to open it up for everyone or do you want uh, I think it would try to respond? Normally we wait for the first round of discussion and then I open to everybody. So please go ahead if you, if you want to respond. Okay, I you know I was I was hoping that I could stall a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Um, it's always nice to see other people too, if they're willing to be seen. <laughs> oh, you could show other people. You know, maybe Let's see. Um, uh, so yes, I mean, I, um, I think I agree uh, with your, First question about Davidson. I mean, I, I think I, I do agree. Um, uh, I was, I, I, I was also a student of Davidson's when I was an undergraduate, um, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there's, there's like there are other connections between Davidson and Cavell, which I won't go into. But um, put it mildly, uh, yes. <laughs> put it mildly, yeah. Um, uh, and um, you know, one thing that I, I. I I found that there was not 
all that much discussion about the, the relation between Davidson and Cavell, despite their their you know standing as sort of towering figures um, over uh, the the last half and of of the twentieth century in in uh, American philosophy. Um, uh, so my my initial sort of characterization of Davidson and his relation to Cavell, you know, sort of bordered on caricature. And I, and I think like the window terminology might sort of be a vestige of that a little bit um, in, in my paper. Um, uh, I, um, I, I, working on this paper, I, you know, I do have a, like a better appreciation for um, uh, the affinity between them. Um, and partly it's, I, I, you know, reading on McDowell's papers um, on Davidson, I think helped me appreciate this better. And, and I think that like the, um, the question um, uh, dash sort of objection that, that um, Richard was making um, uh, is, is connected to something that, you know, like what, um, McDowell calls uh, a modest theory of meaning um, that that he finds in Davidson, and and one of the appeals, you know, that that McDowell um, uh, finds one, something that McDowell finds appealing in Davidson's account is uh, the absence of what he calls psychologism, which you know he thinks Dummett um, falls into, um, where psychologism is understood as um, as you know, using um, like so-called linguistic behavior as a, like a source of evidence for inferences about what might be like the mental causes of that behavior, um, and you know, and you know, what, like McDowell appreciates in in Cavell is, the, uh, sorry, in, in Davidson, um, oh, that was an interesting slip on um, Davidson that that um, uh, that. Like mindedness, I think the way that McDowell puts it, mindedness is, as it were, directly exhibited in the behavior. It's not something to that is like inference. Um, and I think like Richard was like um, bringing this up by um, drawing on the connection between Davidson and, and Aristotle. Um, uh, and I think that's that's an excellent point. I mean, um, I probably. In discussions of Davidson, this is underemphasized, um, uh, um, and is is well worth stressing. I think. Um, uh, so, you know, I I think if like the idea of like a window into the mind sort of um, smacks of like a psychologism about the mind, then um, I definitely think that, that it does not have application. To Davidson, um, it's. I, I guess there might still be um, room for like something like that idea, just um, insofar as um, uh, um, the enterprise. It's it's still um, even if you know you think of like mindedness as directly exhibited in behavior. Um, uh, mindedness is still conceived of, um, sort of speak broadly representationally. That is, you know, it's for Davidson, it's a matter of the exhibition of beliefs and desires. Um, uh, those, you know, attitudes, you know, like propositional attitudes. Um, and uh, for Cavell, like, I mean, the, of course, like his stress on criteria. You know, as so to speak, a condition of propositionality, um, a condition, so to speak, of our having propositional attitudes at all, um, uh, is um, uh, and and so and so the idea of like sharing criteria as opposed to sharing um, uh, belief and meaning, where those are sort of as it were thought of as self-standing independently. <laughs> independent of our sharing of criteria. I mean, um, it seems like that um, is 
really, I think, you know, what I was trying to get at, you know, by, by using the window terminology. Um, uh, um, the, I guess the the um, the question that you asked about Davidson um, uh, at the end of of your discussion of Davidson, Richard, I'm not sure I I fully got that. Um, uh, so this was the question of like whether there's um, there's a point to having a systematic semantic T theory for language. Um, could, could you spell that out a little bit more? I, um, I, I guess I missed the connection with um, Emma Borg and... Um, yeah, yeah. Um, contextualism. Let me say, I think the distance is not even as great as you just made it out on this point. Okay. Um, for Davidson, that I speak in such a way that an interpreter can assign uh, truth condition contributions to the expressions uh, I use is pretty much a way of saying that uh, in order to be intelligible, I must use words according to criteria that are available to the person who interprets me. I think this is a fully transcendental necessity for Davidson also. Mm -hmm. to ex on the difference though, I think what Davidson is doing is trying to give a, I'm suggesting you can have it both ways in a way. Mm -hmm. um, that what he's doing is giving right a minimal theory or modest theory of meaning in McDowell's terms that gives a partial characterization of the structure of what turns out to be a fairly systematically structured capacity. It's a way of taking up the Wittgensteinian thought that there's no <coughs> learning just the meaning of a word. You have to use <coughs> how to Mm -hmm. so in order to uh, speak a language, you have to use, learn how to use words in connection with other words, uh, knowing their syntactic features, how to fit them together, and what the, to use Brandom's terminology, what the material implications of words are. All that's necessary for, for something like sapience in Brandom's terminology. Um, I'm kind of prepared to go with Davidson on all that. Uh, but yeah. I think I would put the difference then as saying that's only one aspect of all the transcendental necessities that attach to being a subject in the relevant sense. Equally important is the stuff Cavell stresses, that we must have pragmatic competence, responsiveness to others, and how we will be understood by them. I don't think Davidson denies that, but he certainly doesn't stress it as much as Cavell does. Uh, but Cavell doesn't stress the systematic character of the semantic bit of the competence, the structured part of that. I think, again, I think we can have that both ways. And then the other big difference, I think, is that Cavell thinks that in our responsiveness to others, um, in responding to how we will be rightly understood by them, and in turn are responding to their efforts to make themselves intelligible, there are never absolute assurances. There are always ways in which things can misfire, but that sort of haunts the possibility of communication. And I'm suggesting that's the direction to look in for the truth of skepticism, roughly. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah, I think I, I, I agree with, um, all of that. I, I guess there's, um, uh, so we, we're suggesting, Richard, that, that Davidson's, that Davidson's, like, um, uh, idea, like, conception of, of, of interpretation, um, in a sense, presupposes what Cavell calls criteria, but does not articulate them or does not sort of bring that to the fore, but it actually presupposes and, and it's, whereas like Cavell sort of can be understood as like articulating what like a Davidsonian um, account of, of meaning would, would need, you know, um, is, is that if we wanted an account of not really in, in competition with one another, they're just right. if we wanted an account of semantic meaning as distinguished from pragmatic effect, uh, wanted an account of what Austin calls locutionary meaning. Um, yeah. 
And I think there are some reasons for wanting that, I was suggesting. I think Davidson is the right place to look because the vocabulary of truth conditions and truth condition contributions gives you a way to capture the systematic and structured character of that semantic competence. But of course, grasp of the systematic and structured part of it, Cavell rightly sees, is not the whole of our linguistic competence. The pragmatics really matter. When I say, would you like to borrow my scooter? You say, sure. And I say, oh no, I wasn't offering it. I am incompetent as a speaker to you in that situation. Right? That's got to be emphasized as well. And Davidson, I think, doesn't catch any of that. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm, um... I, I mean, I see that there's there is that way of reading Davidson. I think that 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 you may be right about that, but I but I, I wonder whether there isn't more of a contrast there that it's I, um it's hard to put one's finger on it exactly, but it it seems like um uh, here's one thought. There's the uh, language, the paper on metaphor, where in effect Davidson says. The only theory of meaning you need for metaphor is my semantic theory. So the truth conditions of Juliet is the sun are Juliet is the sun is held true by Romeo at T. Right. If and only if uh, Juliet is the sun. That's the only story you need about meaning. The rest yeah. is all causal consequence. Yeah. A mere causal consequence is not the kind of thing you could take responsibility for or be held responsible for, I think. Right. And Davidson may miss all that, right? Um, the way in which we, awareness of how we will be understood to communicate something to another subject that can sometimes outrun the semantics of what we say. Uh, again, I think Davidson doesn't get all that at all or has no account of it. Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, good. So, you know, I um, it seems like, um, like for Cavell, there's a sense in which, I, for Davidson, it seems like, well, there's all this, you know, like the pra there are like pragmatic constraints that come into play. There are um, uh, causal factors that come into play, but all that is sort of like enables um, thought and, um, uh, and meaning, you know, understood as it were, where like the proposition, you know, is like the locus of thought, both thought and meaning. Um, and and I'm wondering whether Cavell isn't criticizing that, you know, that that conception of where in thought and meaning resides. So it's like I, I try, you know, I, I was, I was gesturing at this by, you know, by you know, trying to say that 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 there's a kind of there's a competing conception of triangulation, you know, to, um, in 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 Cavell, where it's my relation to another by which, you know, the, the, which is like essential to the world coming into view at all involves my resp taking responsibility in the face of others, you know, or towards others um, mm -hmm. in what I say um, and, and in what I do too, but, you know, particularly in what I say. Um, uh, and whereas Davidson might think of the, all that as sort of, enabling conditions you know of the world coming into view where the world comes into view sort of in you know uh, through the proposition um through a propositional attitude or yeah i kind of think that's right that does seem to me well put um another way to put the same point is that davison is ultimately more interested in producing in some sense of the word theory not a scientific theory a philosophical theory uh, from the point of view of which, as he puts it, we can tell the skeptic to get lost. Um, and yeah. there's a kind of confidence in yeah. having that theory that attaches to Davidson. Um, whereas for Cavell, I think the subject responding to these transcendental necessities is somewhat more fragile always, right? And a lot more remains to be negotiated. It may be worth mentioning the point of personal connection between them on this point. Uh, that is to say, uh, Right. Uh, Donald Davidson's third wife was Stanley Cavell's first wife. Uh, the re if you don't know that, uh, the reason for mentioning this is that Marcia Cavell's book called Becoming a Subject about five years ago is a very useful, interesting book. She sets out in that book to reconcile uh, Freud on human subjects as 
needing or profiting from a kind of deep interpretation and as fragile in various ways with Davidson's theory of mind, with the public character, as it were, uh, and language embodied character of thought. But sub Rosa, the hero of the book, comes out to be Stanley Cavell, I think, because he <laughs> has it both ways on that point. He has an equally strong emphasis on the publicly developed and enacted character of thought in language in relation to other subjects, but also a sense of how fragile, prone to repression, evasion, and so forth human subjects can be. So he's the one that in the end ties together the Freudian and the Davidsonian insights. It's a useful book, I think. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, well, thanks. I'm, I, I haven't really addressed your second question, but I'm, I'm wondering whether, um, I just want to make sure that, that other people have a, a, a chance to, um, yeah. And so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just hold that in reserve. That's okay. Uh, yes, I was going to say that we, we can't go on for more. We can go for more 10 minutes, perhaps. So we have time for a couple of questions if they are not, you know, quick questions, because otherwise we, we might have problems with the next presentation. But please, if, if somebody else has any question, go ahead. If you don't, I might have one. Uh, well, I, I had a quick question that I think is connected to Richard's second one. Uh, in your handout, I think it's in your paper too, but I don't have it at hand. But on on the on the um, outline of the paper, that handout, on item sixteen at the end, there is a one sentence here that I'm not sure whether it's supposed to be a quotation from Cavell or just a kind of allusion. You say that the world as a whole is shown in the act of saying, and it, and it is not the object of acts of saying. And I was wondering if you can say more about the the very idea of the world as a whole. What 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 is that supposed to mean in this context or, or for Cavell or however you want to take the question? Because Cavell almost never really says something general about the world as a whole. He says what it's not. He says it's not you know, a big object. It's not supposed to be construed as some kind of set of objects of perception, but what was what did you mean or or Cavell if this is a quotation in this context speaking of the world as a whole because it, it, you are here talking about the parallel between or the world skepticism or, or you, you made that connection and the other uh, mind skepticism and external world skepticism and there is no such thing as the other as a whole or something like that we just acknowledge others particular others or or we fail to what, what is supposed to mean accepting the world as a whole or avoiding the world as a whole as opposed to accepting, mm. you know, specific facts in the world? Yeah, that's the question. I, I, I didn't really um, specify what I meant. And I, I'm not sure I actually use that. I, I did use that in the handout. I'm not sure I used it in the paper um, or I, I don't know. You, Use it in the presentation, but what I, um, uh, you know, I, I suppose I'm, um, I'm thinking of the world as a whole and something like the way that it's used in Kant, you know, um, uh, where it's not, um, uh, like, um, uh, it's not like, you know, in, in Kant, you know, the world as a whole is not, of course, an object of knowledge. Um, and yet we have, so to speak, um, I mean, he would put it, you know, like we, we must, you know, in our judgments about objects, um, make use of an idea of the world as a whole. Um, as, uh, and, and so they, um, 
you know, I was thinking of like Cavell's criteria as, um, you know, as, as giving us, um, uh, as like the criteria don't sort of, they don't figure in, they're not, um, uh, they have to do with like the application of words and concepts to the world. Um, and yet in the criteria themselves, so to speak, in the interconnectedness between criteria, you know, that constitute what Cabell, you know, and like following Wittgenstein calls our natural form of life, the, that, that um, uh, systematic interconnectedness between criteria um, uh, sort of present the world as a whole. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, that is, it's, it's, it's the interconnectedness of criteria, which, you know, is the condition of our applying concepts and objects to the world. But it's not, it's not, you know, but, but there's something, but the criteria themselves are not, you know, further concepts that we apply to the world, but there's something, some sense in which um, uh, they express, you know, or if, you know, if, if you um, uh, collect, you know, the criteria, as it were, you know, and um, as as the investigations does, um, uh, and and you see a kind of systematicity in our criteria, um, then there's something there, like, you know, what Kant calls like the systematicity, you know, um, the interconnectedness um, of of the world, you know, where it's not, this is the world here is not a thing, you know, it's not an object, but it's, um, it's somehow essentially tied up to our capacity to think about objects. I actually think that what you must mean here, and this is just a short paraphrase, mm -hmm. is the sense of world that Heidegger has when he talks about Welt as opposed to Erde, right? There's a systematically yeah. structured way of concernfully dealing with things under concepts. That's a world, right? Uh, yeah, that, that's by the way, yes. Yeah. That's, that's the way I normally, when, when I hear or read world in Cavell, I try to understand it in Heideggerian. Yeah, in Heideggerian. I think that's generally a good idea, right? Yeah, um, I think Erda is the thing that's presupposed and out there, but it feeds or withdraws from conceptual grasp. Yep. Right. There's an um, a useful passage here, helpful passage here from uh, this is number thirty nine. I don't know if you could put it back up. Um, uh, um, it's from page thirty one and thirty two of the Reason, where you know, he's, like Cavell is characterizing the nature of uh, agreement and criteria and in, in a form of life. Um, uh, and he does like, you know, he's, he, he gives a, a gloss on the famous passage from Wittgenstein section 242. Um, you know, he says it is, uh, he says, um, Uh, the idea of agreement here is not that of coming to or arriving at an agreement on a given occasion, but of being in agreement throughout, being in harmony, like pitches or tones or clocks or weighing scales or columns of figures, that a group of human beings stimmen in their language überein. How he's referring to um, überein stimmen, the, the term that, that is translated agreement. Um, uh, the, that a group of human beings stimming in their language Brian says, so to speak, that they are mutually voiced with respect to it, mutually attuned top to bottom. Um, and that that's what I had in mind in 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 the idea of the world as a whole. Yeah. No, that whatever that means. I'm not sure. That, that was very good. Thank you. I, I was just there is a question in the chat, but I don't know if if anybody else has an, some other question, perhaps, but this is connected to the discussion from Rafael. According to Cavell's thought, to which ex extent, I suppose, is that correct to say that I am responsible not only for what I say, but, but also for the maintenance of our communality? 
you know, sense of the conditions of the intelligible. Yeah, I think those two topics are not separate. Uh, yeah. Being responsible for what I say is a way of being responsible to and for my community, for how we are to go on together. Um, there's a title, there's a paper by Cavell called Politics as Opposed to What? The politics isn't added on or secondary. It's as it were built in as a problem uh, already in one's uh, coming to be a speaker and thinker of a language at all. So I, I, I think absolutely. Um, these two aren't even notionally separable for him. The claim to reason is a claim to self-knowledge, to what we say, but also a claim to community, to what we say, right? Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. that explicitly that, that in, in the passage about claims that these claims about what we say are claims to community. And he goes on and says, you know, this is, um, uh, like it, it's just, this is just an, it's an instantiation of the ancient search of philosophy for reason. Yeah. Maybe we have time for one last quick question. Eric, perhaps, are you? I do have a question, but it's not very quick. Um, okay, well, um, Ar Arata, I've learned so much from this paper as I have from, from your work connecting Cavell and Kant. I just wonder really as briefly as, as possible, I suppose, if you could say something about the notion of the transcendental when it gets extended past or further, you know, not the 12 categories, but, um, you know, there's these pragmatic features as interpersonal features of linguistic competency. Like when we expand or balloon the notion of the transcendental, is it still the transcendental in the same sense as, as Kant? Or, you know, how do we start thinking about what the transcendental is once we've expanded it in the ways that you've shown we should do in order to understand? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Sorry. That wasn't so long, I said. <laughs> that wasn't so long. Um, uh, but yeah, but I think an answer, an adequate answer would have to be long. Uh, uh, so um, yeah, I mean, I, um, I was sort of playing somewhat loosely with the notion of transcendental, kind of piggybacking on Williams, who plays loosely with it. Um, and actually, like, Williams' uses notion of transcendental fact, which um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand you know, what that notion is, but um, uh, um, it's, I think the way that it, it figures in Williams, and I think this is maybe somewhat different from the way it figures in Kant, um, uh, I, um, I mean, that like the broad notion of transcendental seems to be, um, uh, that there's um, that it's sort of inside this idea that you find in Wittgenstein, you find in Kant that that um, that there's no way of like um, grasping an instance of thought or an instance of um, of language that does not already employ the capacity to think or the capacity to to speak. Um, it's just so in a sense like any any grasp of like an actualization of this capacity is a kind of self-grasping you know it's just it's it's really it's a kind of form of self-reflection on by someone who has this capacity on an exercise of it um and then transcendental in that context would then be like a grasp of um the conditions for the exercise of the capacity, you know, conditions for the actual of the actualization of the capacity, and so it would be like inherently self-reflective in its form. Which and that that part I think is is in Kant. I think it's in Wittgenstein. Um, uh, um, but but now, if you. Um, I guess the, what, one way I conceive of the inheritance of Wittgenstein that you find in, that I think you find in both um, Cavell and uh, sorry, not Wittgenstein, the inheritance of Kant <laughs> um, 
that you find in in uh, Cavell and Davidson is the um, extension of this idea now to language where like language is now um, uh, itself viewed as you know the actualization of this rational capacity that the Kant was examining but now um, but now what happens to the term transcendental when you make the linguistic turn um, and that's you know that's what I was that's a way of putting like what what I was trying to explore, you know, in this paper, in the you know the ways that um, both Davidson and um, Cavell developed that. Um, uh, but you know, a lot more would need to be said. I think you know both the, like the term transcendental, but also of, about the linguistic turn. You know, I think like Richard made some very helpful remarks about that. Um, uh, but it's you know it's I think I think it's worth really um, studying because um, much of like current philosophy even like philosophy of language um, has is um, uh, doesn't isn't operating within this like, like the linguistic current broadly speaking like it's it's um, like language in philosophy tends like and much philosophy, my sense is in a way that um, it sort of tends to be viewed as just like one subfield within philosophy. Um, whereas, in a sense, for both both Davidson and Cavell, mm -hmm. it's it's the subject matter of philosophy. Yeah. Um, well, sorry to interrupt. I wish we had some coffee breaks and dinners and all that great stuff that we normally have in conferences, but. <laughs> To continue the conversation, but this was a fascinating conversation. I really had lots of other questions to questions to ask, but perhaps we will have to leave this for for next occasion. In fifteen minutes, we have uh, Eric's uh, presentation, so I think we really should stop here. Thanks, everybody. Sorry for. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. And see you soon. Buzzing eyes. Am I the culprit? <laughs>